Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Like our primitive ancestors of the past, mankind is still a hunter-gatherer. Our past prey was meant to be eaten, to be used as clothing and to provide warmth and protection. And along the way, we would gather material that could be fashioned into tools for hunting. Still more prey we would pursue, no matter where the journey took us. In the pursuit of knowledge, mankind has traversed many hostile territories, fashioned many tools, and has gathered enough information from our surroundings to protect us from environmental threats, both seen and unseen. We have hunted our prey across all landscapes of the earth, under the oceans, in the air, and beyond the limit of our atmosphere. We have chased our prey to the moon, to Mars, across the Milky Way, to the most distant galaxies beyond, right up to the first moments of the Big Bang. We have hunted in the microbial, molecular, atomic, and quantum worlds as well. And each week we return to the cave of humanity with a bounty of new beasts to feast upon. Here on This Week in Science, coming up next. to you, Kirsten. Good science to you too, Justin. It's Thursday once again, and we have all sorts of science in this show. Don't you hope so, at least, because I hope that's why you came to listen, if you're listening right now, because we bring the science. What stories do you have for this week? What oh you my looking? goodness. So far, I'm looking at doing a story about Facebook, because that's so much in the news right now. Got a neat little... Facebook story in there. Uh, lizards, a little evolutionary experiment to do with lizards on islands. Mm -hmm. uh, we have got, we've got some interesting stuff that uh, is about carbon trapped in forests, as well as sex, as well as some other stuff. We'll see what we get to though, because we have a guest in the second half of the show. We so do. We're gonna we have, have to a pack as much as we can into the first half of the show. That's right, so no long-winded ranting and mm -hmm. carrying on, which means I hope that everyone sticks around also for the second half of the show so that you can hear us talk with Sean Lawrence Otto, the author of Fool Me Twice, which has been the This Week in Science Twist Book Club January Book of the Month. And so I hope that everyone out there has been reading along and enjoying the book. Um, I gave Blair the homework assignment of reading it and coming up with some questions. And she's got a couple good ones, I think. So, Blair, what did you bring science-wise? I brought a story about spider sex. Always a good story. <laughs> Always a good story. We like spiders. And, you know, sex is all about life. So, I brought stories. Let's... Dig into the first story that I brought tonight. Uh, what meat do you eat? Well, it doesn't really matter because all of it has antibiotic resistant bacteria on it and in it. Ooh. Isn't that great? Yeah. Even if you're buying wonderfully healthy, organically raised and processed meat, doesn't mean that it is free of pesky bacteria like MRSA. That's right. Uh, researcher Tara Smith, she's an epidemiologist at the University of Iowa uh, uh, College of Public Health in Iowa City. And she looked at bacteria found in pork products that she purchased from Iowa, Minnesota, and New Jersey. 395 packages of pork products that they mixed with a bacterial growth medium and then check to see who grew. They found that 64.8% of the samples were positive for staph. 6.6 had wow. MRSA. MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And the rates of contamination, uh, about 19 of 300 uh, and seven of 95 were for the conventionally versus antibiotic free. So organically raised 
antibiotic-free animals, seven of 95 samples came back with uh, bacteria contamination, which is a very, it's a similar rate to uh, the conventional. The question is, how is the bacteria, how is the bacteria getting there? We, we think that giving antibiotics to conventionally raised animals is leading to antibiotic resistance and antibiotic resistance, uh, resistant strains then can be transferred from animals to people. And so that's one of the big concerns is that we are overusing antibiotics in raising the animals that we eat. And that's going to, down the line, cause problems for people and the bugs that potentially could infect us. So great people want to pay for organic, antibiotic-free animals. But the question is whether or not now that's really making a difference. Um, they don't know where in the line from field to to table the uh, or field to petri dish in this case the contamination is taking place it could take place at processing plants uh but because there are pro processing plants that do process conventional meat and organic meat and they're supposed to clean everything in between but maybe they're not getting everything clean and some contamination cross contamination is occurring but the question is how and where the contamination is occurring. And then once that occurred, once we know that, we still have to go back to the question of are antibiotics in the feed uh, cycle, are they affecting human health? That's, anyway. Yeah, that's an interesting question too. That First thing I would think of here though is with these high rates, I mean, this is going to be, you're going to get MSRA pretty much guaranteed if you eat enough chicken, if you eat enough poultry, right? It's going to yeah. be there. So it's, you know, it's there now. Cook the heck out of your meat. That's the, right. that's the real, that's the real line of defense right there is just cook it really well. Wow. Yeah. MRSA is a really interesting one. It's, uh, it, 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 it kills a lot of people every year, but uh, transmission can happen all over the place. It's thought that approximately 1.5% of Americans carry MRSA without it being an infection, but actually just carry it in their noses. And so people who carry it and uh, sneeze or wipe their nose and then uh, touch a keyboard or a telephone or something, they could be uh, inadvertently spreading MRSA. And you don't know who those people are. They're children. <laughs> They're children. <laughs> yeah, the vectors. Who gets the... boogers everywhere? <laughs> and then I guess MRSA probably needs uh, a way it gets on the skin, but then it probably needs a cut or something in order to infect you. Yeah. Yeah. So there's really MRSA, the Staphylococcus aureus is a bacteria, a type of bacteria that is prevalent. It it's in the dirt, it's on top, it's, it's on all sorts of stuff. Um, but staph, people know you can get a staph infection. Staph, uh, when uh, it does infect the mucous membranes, when it can get into uh, a wound, it can actually cause a lot of trouble. MRSA is the, the most dangerous of the strains of Staphylococcus aureus because of the fact that it is resistant. It's, it's evolved resistance to methicillin, uh, which is one of the top antibiotics, top of the chain of antibiotics that we have to combat bacteria like staph. Um, you know, we, ho we hope that we can develop more antibiotics, new ways to get around these bacteria, but they're always going to be uh, mutating and evolving to beat us. It's a bacteria beat antibiotic world. Wow. Yeah. So if, if uh, you remember last week's show, uh, another good reason to shock your meat. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. right. That's right. Shock your meat. Shock your meat. Shock. Hit, hit your chicken with a, a plasma, too. That'll, that'll also <laughs> knock out anything. But we've, it's amazing that we haven't been able to address uh, that in the processing portion. We, we, at some point, we were talking about eradic, er, irradiating 
all of our meat. Mm -hmm. And that, that caused too much fear. But I, I think being able to shock all the meat, making that a new policy, that shouldn't be too frightening for the general public. Yeah. Uh, speaking about general public, how you use Facebook may say more about you than you think. And I don't mean just that you've shared personal information that you know is going to marketers who are going to send it back at you. It may actually say something about your psychological state. Uh, in this example of the study here, people with low self-esteem were found to behave counterproductively, bombing friends with negative updates about their lives and making themselves forcibly less likable. According to a new study, which will be published in Psychological Science, which is a journal of the Association for Psychological Science, we had this idea that Facebook would be a really fantastic place for people to strengthen their relationships, says Amanda Forrest, graduate student, University of Waterloo, who co-wrote the study with her advisor, uh, Joanne Wood. They, uh, these two have been working on self-esteem in general for a long time now and created this study using uh, Facebook updates. So what they did was they had, they had their, uh, their students produce 10 of their most recent status updates from Facebook. Then they gave those status updates to a, a third party, a stranger, somebody who didn't know them, to rate the statements on how much they liked the person based on those, uh, wh whether those were negative or positive on the individual statements, and then as a collection of those status updates, whether they liked the person or not. And they used strangers, the third party stranger, because they... Earlier research indicates most people have uh, a lot of strangers or uh, sort of acquaintances through their Facebook thing that they're getting feeds from whether they want to or not until they, you know, click to hide them, I guess. So it discovered people with low self-esteem were more negative than people with high self-esteem and the strangers mm -hmm. liked them less. <laughs> so they, uh, they also found that people with low self-esteem get more responses from their real Facebook friends when they post highly positive updates compared to less positive updates. So you finally said something positive about your day as opposed to, meh, ah, go outside, why bother? <laughs> and so, you know, it's like, oh, I, I, I found a penny, a lucky penny today. And then you'll get lots of hits if you typically post negative stuff from your good friends who are just happy to have something <laughs> they can interact with you on. Uh, people with high self-esteem, on the other hand, get more responses when they post negative items because hmm. I guess of the rarity of it. You know, you finally had a bad day after two years of positive updates right. and people Never get really having... concerned. That's out of the ordinary for that person. Right. They also found that people with low self-esteem may uh, make these personal disclosures uh, much more often than they ever would in private because in or in, in, in private, in personal life, in face-to-face, -face, meat space, what do you call it, meat space world, right? They, they wouldn't normally update and inundate their friends with this much negativity. But sort of having that remote control for hitting the button and sending out those negative sort of feelings about themselves or about their days or what have you, uh, they tend to do so much, much more often. But that's kind of an interesting thing, you know, this is on self-esteem, but how far away do you think we are from the algorithm that does begin to take your status updates aside from the specific information that we, we volunteer uh, when doing social networking, but can actually put together a psychological profile of us? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's a, uh, that it would be a, good thing necessarily. I mean, that would take psychological profiling to the next, the next level. Um, coming up with an, with an algorithm, I mean, it, what it make what it means to me is that we're the next, that's the next step to having, um, a human like bot that could post mm -hmm. on a, a social network that people would, you know, you could have a, have some kind of bot that people wouldn't necessarily guess is, a bot because it's, it's interactions would be much more authentic. Mm. It would have more of a personality. So maybe that algorithm could be better used for uh, artificial intelligence purposes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But yeah. I'm just going to, you know, be, just be wary though. Also, if you get one of those little advertisements in the side of your, your uh, Facebook uh, offering you help with low self-esteem, <laughs> might, might, might be time to <laughs> post a couple positive 
<laughs> affirmations out there. Yeah. Today, yeah. Speaking of Facebook, I've, I've almost given it up. And today I just about wanted to throw up my hands. All my friends are like, whining and whinging about not getting Burning Man tickets because of the lottery system this year. And everyone's so sad. I didn't get my tickets. And I understand that, but that's all I saw on Facebook today. But you got yours? <laughs> <laughs> that's why you didn't care about all those <laughs> Low self-esteem whiners with their negative updates. It's like, nah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. I'm just going to hide you until after Burning Man. Woo! <laughs> All right. It's time for Blair's Animal Corner. <laughs> <laughs> there she is, back in the corner. There she is. <laughs> I am back in the corner. So I found a really cool um, article about orb weaver spiders. This is the species... Nephalengus malabarensis. I think I said that right. Anyway, it's... You're asking me? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what is the proper pronunciation? Uh, so these guys, they have some really interesting habits in their copulation. And first of all, the female is cannibalistic towards the male. Right. Pretty much always post the copulation. And so I they think. found recently that these guys have been purposefully castrating themselves at the end of their copulation session. On purpose. Yes. What would the purpose of that be? Well, there's a few different purposes. The first would be to get away so that they would not be eaten. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> the second would be something that's actually pretty popular It in arthropod species and a bunch of different ones where they actually will plug up the female so that other males cannot have access to her. And so mm -hmm. they're the only possible father of future mm -hmm. genera generations. But what would be required for them to do that would only be a portion of their organ, but they have been breaking the whole thing off. And so they did some research and found that Essentially, when they broke the entire sexual organ off, the organ would continue injecting sperm into the female post-coitus. So basically, they're improving their... Their chances their of chances. conceiving. Yeah, right? because they there was a way higher proportion of sperm in females when the males broke off their own organ. Because apparently, the females will do it as well. They will do it to them but they won't right. break off the whole thing. So this way, they're really just trying to increase the likelihood of spreading their DNA, which is pretty interesting. By castration. Yes. <laughs> that is the most horrifying story. <laughs> in a really long time. Except for one thing that you said, though, that really does make sense. That the, uh, the broken off unit kept doing what it was intended for after the fact and injecting sperm. It does, it does give an argument that the thing has a mind of its own because that <laughs> it doesn't even need us. It's just gonna, wow, that was a rough story. I'm glad we, I'm glad we all got through that. Aren't you <laughs> glad you're not a spider? Yes. I, I would have followed. Or if they were asking, it's like, well, would you like your ladies with two legs or with eight legs? I'd be like, yeah, give me eight legs. Woo. You know, um, no, but uh, in the lottery of life, I got stuck with two, I thought, which was rough. But no, now I'm very happy to be a human being and not a spider. I, I now have no regrets. No regrets. I just need to tell men you're, you should be so happy I'm not an orb weaver spider. You never really hear, I mean, you don't, you, you hear bad things. There's the, the bad connotation of being a black widow, right? right? You know, the hum, in the in human society, the black widow is, you know, it's not a, not a positive stereotype, but um, you don't hear anything she, about the orb. The spider. orb weaver spider. The well, orb she, weaver woman. <laughs> Black no, Widow nothing, devours she's... her mate too, eats his head off. I mean, this that spider love is just it's just a rough, it's a rough relationship in the spider yeah, world. They get the short end of the stick, the male orb weaver spiders. Oh, yeah, that was, but in doing that, what they just... do, they are <laughs> I'm just gonna let them go. <laughs> in doing what they do, they 
you know, they help the next generation. They, mm -hmm. spiders, male spiders are very selfless and giving. Yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think I have time for one quick story um, before we go to the break. What does a yawn say about your relationship? Mm. What does it say about your relationship? Uh, some researchers. Oh, Justin's yawning quickly mm -hmm. after I mentioned yawning. That Soon means as that, I hear the word or even read the word yawn. Even you know, reading the word article, yawn makes me yawn. I this article was very difficult for me to read, actually. Oh, this is a picture. <laughs> the picture, I'm gonna start yawning right now. I'm looking at it, but the, the picture and actually just reading the article, I wanted to start. I was starting to yawn all the time. How many people are yawning right now in the audience? Um what the researchers found in this particular study, study published in PLOS One. Researchers Ivan Norcia and Elisabetta Palagi found that yawning, while being contagious, is also a good indicator of how close you are to somebody uh, in, in, relationship-wise. So is the yawn, does the yawn occur more easily or more quickly? It, it, that would be an indicator that you are, are, have a closer relationship, a closer bond. Whereas it, if it's harder for a yawn to be elicited, then your relationship is much uh, further. You're not as closely related or, uh, I guess, behaviorally connected to one another. So uh, the researchers got, uh, they wanted to know how well people were connected. And this, I don't understand how they would really do this, but the, the study methods I think are really fascinating. They actually followed 109 adults in their natural environments for uh, over a year, probably not each adult for the entire year, but they followed 109 people uh, and, and observed them at work, in, at home, at school, whatever it happened to be, over the course of a year, it's a really long time period. They recorded uh, the time of yawns when when the subject yawned and the proximity of people nearby. Uh, and then who were the people that were nearby? Were they strangers, acquaintances, friends, kin? And the frequency of the yawns by these people within three minutes after the original yawn and the time elapsed between the yawns and the original yawn. Are you yawning yet? Now that I've explained it. But, I've, got a, uh, I've got another couple in there since you started this. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, so they also recorded position of the observers relative to the yawner as to whether they could only see or hear the yawn, the gender, social context, nationality, all such a sort of uh, all sorts of things to try and figure out what was causing the yawns. And the thing that really predicted a yawn and its contagiousness was emotional closeness. So the closer you are emotionally to somebody can be told all in a yawn. Wow. That's, a, that's, that's interesting uh, that they, there could be that connection there too. You know, the, if you ever read the sleep book, do you have that yet? I don't know if you're reading Dakai, the Dr. Seuss yet. No, not yet. The, you should get the sleep book. Um, it would be nice if you would go to sleep. Nice. In there, it's all the whole thing starts with a bunch of Zeus creatures yawning, and I've never been able to get past the first few pages without yawning several times just reading. It. <laughs> um, it, another interesting point: uh, kids don't actually start yawning; they're not they don't they aren't affected by the contagiousness of yawns until they're about two to two and a half years old, uh, when they start to have a sense of. Uh, of other people and their relationship to other people. And they start to uh, embody what is, what's known as the theory of mind. So uh, they actually start to have consciousness and conscious awareness of the consciousness of others. And it's- They have consciousness so before that, but of course they're, they're sociopaths. <laughs> that right. Thing, right? They don't care about anybody Little else. Little baby sociopaths, <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, but it's it's just so fascinating to me. Just absolutely fascinating that it 
yawns are contagious. And now we, um, now this study suggests that they, they are affected by emotional closeness, your bonds with other people, and that they don't, you have to have some kind of awareness, autonoetic awareness to be able to be affected by a yawn. Very it's cool. fascinating. Yeah. So are we, uh, are we at the break? Are we at the break? Are we going to going away and then coming right back again? We are. Mm -hmm. I think it's about time for a break. Awesome. When we come back, we'll have uh, Sean Lawrence Otto, author of Fool Me Twice, Fighting the Assault on Science in America. He'll be our guest tonight. Woohoo! Woohoo! Stay tuned, everyone. We'll be back after this. I'd like to thank Audible.com for sponsoring this hour of This Week in Science. Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks on the web with over 75,000 different titles and a variety of genres. Twist has found all sorts of sciencey books in their library over the years and know that you can too. That's right. You can find science and listen to it through Audible. And they'll give you a free audiobook just for signing up. So if you go right now, sign up, get your free audiobook. Maybe it'll be a science one. Whatever you choose, you just go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist. It's that, e that easy. Audiblepodcast.com slash twist and sign up and get your free audiobook download. And twist is supported by listeners like you. Your donations pay for our hosting, bandwidth, contractors we need to hire, fun things we try to do, like put bricks in the Twit Brick House wall, which thanks to you, we have two there. Thank you very much for letting us do that. We appreciate any amount, $2 to 2,000, 2 million. I might be crazy for saying it, but you know, go big, right? You make this show possible. We accept donations through PayPal currently and have made the process very easy by putting donation buttons on each episode page on our website, twist.org. So all you have to do, go to our website, twist.org, go to the most recent episode if you haven't listened to it yet, take a listen, make a few comments in the, in the comment section, interact with the community and hit that donate button to donate. We really couldn't do it without you. Thank you for your support. So shall we call Sean then right now? Yes, please. Hello. Hello. Is this Sean? It is. Fantastic. This is Kiki. Hi there. Are you getting a video? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Ah, uh, here it comes. All right. Okay. There we go. Yay, video. All right. Wonderful. Yay, so, art in the background. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, well, go ahead. I had, to pick this, I had to pick this spot after I saw where Justin was sitting. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> dueling, dueling pictures, dueling artwork. So we're in our break and, oh, you can put three pictures up at the same time. How did you guys do that? That's amazing. When did that happen? That's impressive, actually. 
This is really great, Alex. Brian, thumbs up. You're H- going to totally have to tell me how you did that. That's very awesomeness. It's called expensive switching equipment. It's called magic. <laughs> magic. Okay, so all I can say is I'm glad I am not an orb weaver spider. Right? Oh, yeah. I haven't unclenched. <laughs> <laughs> I started a kegel during that story, and oh, it right. hasn't really... I've got a kegel cramp now from that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, yeah, so as you're aware, we're in the, in the break, so what we're going to do is when... Uh, when we're all ready, we'll, we'll just have the music come back up and we'll do a brief introduction and then start the interview. Okay, okay. so uh, so this is live streaming and then you are recording it too? How does that work? Yes, yeah, so it's live streaming to the Twit audience right now and uh, we're recording it, so I will get the audio of this and edit it and put it out in our RSS feed this next week. Um, and additionally, the video will go out to our YouTube account. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Okay. How's it going over there in the studio? Good. Should we, it's should good. we come back? We're okay. ready. We're ready, ready to go. The music. Okay. You go with the music, maestro. Somewhere within this scattered plot Our first assumptions were correct Disprove the rest It's our methods of hypothesis And patience are the only things I need We're on a pair of goggles And we're looking for the things I could see Let's And we're back with more This Week in Science. That's right. And we are visited, Skyped by, Skyped by Skype? Yes, I guess that's how it would work. <laughs> uh, by Sean Lawrence Otto, who is the author of Fool Me Twice, Fighting the Assault on Science in America. And Sean has been a science advocate. This is from his website, a science advocate and humanitarian who works for Smarter Politics on a global scale, organized a national science debate between Barack Obama and John McCain. And he's a regular speaker at major science events. And his book was published in October of 2011. Additionally, he's a, a speaker a filmmaker, and has uh, been published in Rolling Stone, Science, Issues in Science and Technology, Salon, Huffington Post, Mini Post, New Scientist, Scientific American, Nature Medicine, and many others, as well as uh, writing for a blog. Sean, thank you for joining us this evening. Ah, It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. What what brought you to the point that you, you said to yourself, there's a book here, fighting the assault on science in America, and and you just had to write it. Oh, well, it was just stunning to me when we were on the campaign trail in 2008, and we were trying to get the candidates for president to engage on science. And we had, uh, at that point in time, this was almost four years ago now, this was mm-hmm. about March, I think, of 2008, and we had uh, gotten the National Academies to sign on as co-sponsors. The AAAS signed on. The Council on Competitiveness. We had lined up the Franklin Institute in downtown Philadelphia uh, shortly before the Pennsylvania primary, and we reached out to all the campaigns uh, about doing a science debate on the big, big topics that mm-hmm. – We've been stuck on, really, as a nation for, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years in some cases. Uh, And they tried to ignore us. And they ignored us uh, and they ignored us. And we reached out to supporters of the campaign, people we knew that were uh, top advisors and very close. And finally, we got uh, Obama and Clinton to begin to engage with us. But they decided instead of doing a science debate to do a... Uh, I think it was called the Compassion Forum uh, at Messiah College in Harrisburg. So what that made me think about is what has happened in our national dialogue where candidates for president will talk about religion 
which used to be kind of a taboo topic. Right. But they won't talk about science, which lies at the center of so many of our big challenges and affects everybody's lives. So I thought there's got to be a book in there. Right. There's, there's got to be a lot. There, there's a lot to say on this subject, at least. Um, in terms of, of the approach that you've taken, so fighting the assault on science in America, how is the book uh, different, say, from Chris Mooney's The Republican War on Science, where he broke down uh, you know, what was happening within the Republican Party and how it was fighting against science? Well, Chris takes a more partisan perspective. I don't think that um, uh, anti-science is a partisan issue, even though it seems to be very much that way right now in the Republican primary campaign trail. seems like any time a campaign is down in the polls, uh, that candidate takes some kind of anti-science position to try and regain some traction. But really, th this book uh, explores historically how we've fallen in and out of love with science and how different parties have fallen in and out of, out of love with science. It used to be the Democrats about 100 years ago that were the anti-science party, and most scientists were Republicans. That was when William Jennings Bryan was running on the anti-evolution ticket for president, and he ran three times, uh, and he drove, uh, you may recall, the Scopes Monkey Trial eventually, uh, pushed through a lot of state laws in different states, uh, banning the teaching of evolution in science classes. Um, but things changed over time. So the book really takes a historical perspective. It looks at America's relationship to science, uh, both in terms of the founding of the country and why science was so important to democracy and to uh, some of the founding fathers, but also to what has happened since and why is it that science has become a taboo topic on the political campaign trail? Because it wasn't just Republicans that wouldn't engage with us. Uh, it was uh, Democrats, too. That's interesting. So it's just it's on both sides of the line where it's it's a become a taboo subject, as, as you've said. Um, something you, you wrote is that, you know, and, and this is not. I guess this isn't something that people don't already know. Knowledge is power and power can shift uh, can shift political structures. Um, is that, is that where a lot of the problem is coming from? Are they, are, are the people in politics today, are they just concerned that their power is going to crumble? Well, I think the problem comes from a bunch of different areas. Um, number one, you know, I, I, I open the book with a quote from Thomas Jefferson, who said, whenever the people are well-informed, they can be trusted with their own government. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, true then, and it's true now. The only problem is, is that science has advanced uh, tremendously in the last couple hundred years since he said that. Um, I think that was 1789 when he wrote that. Uh, science now impacts uh, all of our lives, and no one person can understand all of science. Uh, if you've ever toured the Library of Congress, you'll see uh, Thomas Jefferson's library recreated there. And it's a beautiful octagonal structure, uh, or maybe it's more than octagonal, it's some, somewhat circular. And he had all the books arranged around him uh, uh, by subject matter, and he essentially had almost all of human knowledge at his fingertips there. That's no longer possible. So as but now science we have advances, the in internets. <laughs> Yeah, we do have the internet, but we don't have that kind of subject-by-subject uh, subject filing system, and we don't really have any real curation on the internet. So we don't really know uh, how to separate out knowledge from nonsense. And um, what's happened since is that science has gotten so complex and it impacts so many policy levels. The question is, is are the people still well enough informed? And what is the burden of information that is placed on them? And then when you consider that most politicians come out of the humanities, and probably their last science class was maybe high school chemistry. And many of them probably have even forgotten what they learned about inductive reasoning and the way that science works uh, and don't understand a lot about it. It becomes kind of a problem for policymaking. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you know, think about what's happened uh, since, say, Sputnik. And science got a lot of funding uh, and scientists really turned inward. Uh, Vannevar Bush, who developed the National Science Foundation, had a great idea to free scientists from having to uh, uh, appeal to wealthy philanthropists and the general public for support. Um, and they've done a lot of great science in that time. But 
the muscles for public outreach have atrophied. Uh, and scientists aren't very good at it by and large anymore, and they remove themselves from our national discussion. So other voices have moved in to fill that gap. And then when the Cold War uh, ended, when the Soviet Union fell, suddenly we didn't have a national competitor to, uh, to drive our funding of science anymore, and science was suddenly on a pretty shaky footing. Do you think that's really uh, that it really is on shaky footing at the moment? I, I, I feel from observing stuff that there's some kind of a lag time uh, to changes that occur in the in the in the public uh, in, in, the, in the public awareness. So um, scientists now you see scientists talking a lot more to media outlets. Uh, public speaking training, public media training is, and outreach training is a lot more prevalent. NSF is requiring outlet, uh, outreach uh, from the grant the, the scientists they give grants to. Um, additionally, we have blogging and podcasts and uh, and books. And it seems like science communication in the United States, at least, is at an all time high. It seems like so many people are talking about science and, you know, the big bag, the big bang theory is a popular show on television. Um, it's a, it's a comedy and a fictional show, but at the same time, the fact that it can actually survive in a, uh, an environment that's supposed to be, um, I guess it is supposed to not appreciate science. It doesn't really, doesn't really drive well. But I, th I think what it, I think what it would it, part of the thing, I, and I totally agree with you, Kirsten. I think that science communication is getting a lot better, but it's overcoming a deficit, and it and it almost doesn't matter now, also, because it, when it comes to politics, I believe politicians have pretty much figured out what marketers figured out some time ago that actual information isn't necessary to sell or to get votes. You are you're working on an emotional level in all of these things, and. And science uh, can be construed I, I, in a negative emotional uh, way if, you know, you can connotate science as being against, if you connotate global warming as being against, you know, an energy policy or affordable gasoline or something of that nature, which is what's used by, you know, one side of the argument. It's really hard to overcome, and I think they know they can't overcome the emotional arguments, the emotional uh, uh, appeals or pandering with uh, with a basic informational argument of why these things need to be addressed. So it's probably why politicians are so afraid of it. There's not a lot to be gained by being factual. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's sad, but I mean, I think I would think that would be, you know, if I was running for office, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't try to run on a whole lot of facts and numbers and, and that sort of thing. You'd want, you'd want to make the emotional appeal because that's what people would respond to. Mm -hmm. So you almost, Absolutely. I almost don't, don't blame the politicians for not making it a debate issue, um, but allowing uh, allowing it to not be funded. You know, you you still the the idea that they actually believe that what won their campaign is the right way to run the nation. Beyond that, would be really frightening. And I think we're crossing that line now, where we're not seeing the funding in science. We're not seeing. The pursuit of these uh, of, of the, the NSF. Like, what are the amazing statistics to come from the seven hundred billion dollar bailout? Was that was that would have been what is it? Uh, uh, one hundred and fifteen years of the National Science Foundation's budget. Right. It's insane. And I think that you're right that it is an emotional argument uh, that has to be made. But keep in mind. Um, that at one point in time, that emotional argument was pro-science. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when John F. Kennedy, for instance, was running for president, he had to promise the nation that he wouldn't let his uh, Catholic religion interfere with his reason and judgment as president. And now candidates almost make the opposite argument. Some of them, you can hear them saying, you know, they're not going to let knowledge and science interfere with their values if elected president. Um, so there has been a transformation, and a lot of that has come from, um, you know, I, I was at a, at, at a meeting in, in Washington a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about this and about the relationship between science and democracy. And really where the two started to, it's due to science and, and, and politics really started to diverge a little bit, was back in, you know, 60s and 70s when environmental science came along. It used mm -hmm. to be that 
science created new ways to make money, new ways to innovate, new ways to build businesses. Uh, and now a lot of that is being born by engineering and science, uh, this complex system science came out and we started becoming aware of some of the consequences of some of the science that we developed earlier. And we started putting the brakes on and saying, wait a minute, uh, there are some issues here. And at that point, uh, science became more of a political target. And that doesn't mean that business, for instance, is anti-science. Business is very pro-science, uh, but they don't have any compunction about being anti-science if, uh, if it doesn't fit with their agenda. And they've gotten very good at developing emotional narratives that uh, sell, based on science, by the way, that, that sell their message. <laughs> and that's, that's a total shame, too. One of the things in the 60s that the environmental movement came out against was nuclear energy, which in retrospect probably would have been the most pro-environmental thing to go forward with. If, uh, if a little bit more faith had been in, in science to overcome the problems within it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it definitely has a lot to do with uh, the media environment as well as the educational environment. And do we, do we see anything happening in terms of uh, changes within education that are affecting the way that, uh, that science and politics relationship. Do we, have, do we have another John Dewey out there ready to <laughs> revolutionize our education system? Oh, every politician wants to revolutionize our education system. Uh, but unfortunately, they can't agree on just how to do it. I think that right now there, there's a concerted effort through, for instance, ALEC, uh, the um, uh, uh, American Legislative Exchange Council, I believe, is what that acronym stands for. I might be incorrect there. Uh, but anyway, that's um, uh, funded by some libertarian think tank money. Uh, mm -hmm. and, it, and it flies uh, state legislators in for conferences and provides them with model legislation. And some of that model legislation right now is focused on education. For instance, teaching of uh, doubt about uh, climate science or, or skepticism towards it. Uh, coupled with uh, teaching creationism in science classes. Um, so there's kind of a movement by um, people with uh, predetermined or ideological agendas that aren't necessarily aligned with teaching science uh, that is kind of moving in the science space and education. If you're talking about more broader academically, I think that, you know, Kiki, what you were saying is very true with the NSF and the public outreach efforts that they're doing right now, which are really important. Uh, that's just a step to begin to turn the Titanic. Um, but we've got an entire tenure system built up in our universities that really doesn't reward public outreach. And it's going to take a long time to begin to turn that around. Yeah, unfortunately, a, a, a quote that I, I heard once on an NPR show sticks in my head that uh, science advances at the rate of funerals. Uh, <laughs> I hope that that's not necessarily the, the case. Yeah, um, I think I think that that came that probably is kind of a derivative of that Max Planck quote mm -hmm. that uh, people don't accept new paradigms; they just die and go away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have to you kind of have to wait for for people to to move on before the upstarts, the young upstarts, the, or the young whippersnappers, you know, can have a little have a place in the in the system for their ideas to find room to grow. Yeah. Um, I was talking to PZ Myers about this topic and uh, that, that was a point that he made in that really a lot of the uh, younger scientists and uh, academics get it, get public outreach, um, get blogging, get uh, uh, interacting with the general public in a different way and are much more interested in it. It's much more highly valued. Um, so there is a real generational shift that is happening, I think. And what do you think, what do you think the solution could be? How do we get on track to become a more scientifically conscious uh, society as a whole? Well, I think that scientists need to uh, spend, like I said, a lot more time in, in public outreach. Uh, and, you know, it's got to change that the vast majority of Americans, when polled, don't even know a living scientist, even though scientists may be their neighbors. Uh, but they don't realize that those people are scientists. Uh, that's got to change. Uh, we've got to have a lot more 
communication about it on the political level. You know, what Science Debate seeks to do, and that's at sciencedebate.org, and that's our effort to get candidates for public office, in this case presidents, debate the top science challenges that are facing the country. What we try to do is we try to fit in that gap between science or scientists, politicians, the public, and the media. And by bringing those four quadrants together in a debate format to talk about the policy implications of new science, to bring ideas about what the cutting science is together with scientists to, to do a post-game analysis uh, for the public and talk about um, how well these arguments were grounded in, in knowledge and in science and what the implications of them are. That is a way to begin to pre present this kind of complex information in the way that adults are used to taking in complex information in our society, which is in the context of our public policy dialogue. That's what we've been doing for, you know, 30, 40 years now. It's been pretty heated in our public policy dialogue. But that's there's enormous complexity to the information that we get across. And if candidates can talk about complex economics, I mean, it, it's, it's yeah, it, the Austrian school. I mean, come on, that's pretty complex stuff. And if candidates can talk about that and, and the general public can grasp onto those ideas, um, they can certainly talk about science. Absolutely. Did you have any questions, Blair? Yeah. So basically my main interest in this book in general, and also just, you know, science is science education to the young kids. I feel like they it's corny to say, but they're the future, right? So uh, it's easy to educate the kids that are coming to science, especially, you know, that come to zoo camp and stuff like that. And even in public schools, there's a lot more of what is understood as science. But a lot of the kids that are going to grow up and be influential in the world are the kids in private schools where we have very little control over injecting science into their curriculum, especially religiously based private schools. And so I just wonder if there would be a way in the future to make sure that these kids are exposed. Well, yeah, and sure. A lot of that happens uh, in uh, first or second year uh, of college and, uh, you know, needing to do some remedial education there. I think that the biggest, most important thing that colleges can do is to teach at that first year coming in, critical thinking and philosophy of science. I mean, what is inductive reasoning? And how is it that, for instance, uh, you know, Newt Gingrich said something pretty clever about climate change the other day. He didn't really say that uh, he doesn't think it's happening. He said, I don't think it's been fully proved yet. And yes. that yeah. is very clever because anybody that understands science will realize that Proof That's a is a mathematical statement. concept. Yeah. That's a fair statement. It has. <laughs> it never statement. will be, right? Yeah. So he, he didn't paint himself in a corner at all there, but it sounded to his constituents that he was attempting to appeal to like, like he was uh, singing their song. Um, but if people understood inductive reasoning, they understood critical thinking, they could figure out when somebody's fooling them and when somebody's presenting a bogus argument and how um, science fits into their lives a little bit better, I think that would go a long way. Absolutely. And in 2012, since this is such a big election year with uh, science debate, are you uh, going to be doing any special events or, I mean, you're promoting more debates throughout the year. Um, is there anything that we should look out for in particular? Well, we're going to be at the, uh, the, you know, the American Association for the Advancement of Science is having their annual meeting. It's in Vancouver this year. And I, I don't uh, I'm not sure why it's in Vancouver, out of the country, but that's where it is. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to be there uh, meeting with a, a number of uh, scientists that are supporters, and we're going to be um, uh, doing little video interviews uh, with them about why this is important. Um, we're also going to be rolling out on our website uh, coming up in the next month a chance for the general public uh, to weigh in on what they think the top science issues are, if they think it's climate change or biodiversity loss or ocean acidification or innovation and economic competitiveness or science education or, um, you know, clean energy. 
there's uh, health research. You know, there's there there's 14 that we will post, which are the original 14 that we developed from the 3,400 that our signers submitted to us last time around. Yeah. And then we'll open that we'll open that up for comments. Uh, so people can comment on those. They can vote them or up or, up or down, and they can submit other ones. Um, then we're also doing another national poll coming up uh, to see what the public's attitude really is about science and about whether the candidates for president ought to be debating these things. Great. I hope I hope that in the future, as we move through this year, we can get you back on the show to give us an update as to how different candidates are doing and what's going on, because it would that's something that uh, that we love to do here at Twist is let people know how science is fitting into their world and through politics, especially. And I, I yeah, would love absolutely. to see in that the future. Fun. I'd love to see in the future, instead of having the vice president, who we don't really hear from again after the election, he's, he's, he comes in there and talks for a little bit and he's gone. Really, he's pretty inco inconsequential um, <laughs> in those debates. What would be great is to have their Department of Energy uh, or, you know, their top scientist uh, have a separate debate where you've already announced who you've chosen for that very important, crucial role going into the election. And then those two square off and debate the scientific issues that are going to be dominant in the next administration. That would be the ideal future. Wouldn't that be awesome? You know, this last time around, it was the first time that, that a president went into office with a fully formed science policy and an idea of how it fit in with the rest of his agenda. And I would just love it if what you just described, Justin, happened that um, and not only at the presidential level, but what if debating science uh, kind of became a normal expected thing like debating economics and debating foreign policy, even at the congressional level. That's where we really need to get. So I, I'm all for uh, the energy secretary debate. <laughs> <laughs> it would be awesome. Um, and as if you, if you have any advice for us as for talking about science and uh, talk coming as as people who speak about science, how how should we approach things going forward? Is there is there a slant that we should take or consider that we're maybe not doing? Oh boy, that's pretty open ended. I'm not really sure how which part of that to <laughs> talk about um you know there's uh like for instance there's a great tool now that Stephen lewandowski has put out called the debunking handbook you might want to have them on your show um and that's a nice seven page tool that people can download uh for free from the internet uh, and it gives them great communication skills based on a lot of the things that I talk about in my book, a lot of the most recent uh, neuroscience and psychological studies about how people take in science information, especially science information that they might not be familiar with or that they might uh, disagree with already, and how to debunk uh, ideas without getting people's backs up. Because a right. lot of times... You know, what we do is uh, take a head on approach, a science deficit approach, saying, no, that's wrong. That's not the way it is. And we forget that these are emotional topics and that that full frontal assault usually only gets people to dig into their anti science positions even more so. All right. Justin, you taking notes? I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And I, your book is fabulous, and we've been we've been reading it throughout the month and enjoying it. I came across uh, came came across it through a Scientific American article of yours, and just I'm very excited that you're uh, that you're talking about this and that we you know are that you have written a book that puts more information at the public's fingertips so that people can start thinking about this. Thank you very much and uh, good luck with the book and getting the word out to people, what they should be thinking about moving forward. Thank you. Well, thank you for uh, helping me do that too. These, as you can tell, this is a real passion project of mine. So I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you on your show. You're welcome. And anyone out there, you can go to seanauto.com if you are interested in checking out more of Sean Lawrence Auto stuff. Uh, if you haven't checked out the book yet, you can take a little look at some ex excerpt uh, contents, reviews there at the website. And there are also links to other writings that Sean has done and uh, links to other interviews. I, I hear you spoke with uh, with 
Alan Boyle from MSNBC recently. So there's you're out talking to all sorts of people, which I think is great. Talk to as many people as you can. That's right. That was actually a fun one. That was in Second Life, and I actually made it through without accidentally taking off all my avatar's clothes. So that was a big <laughs> plus for me. That's that's good. As, as long as you can do that, or I don't know, maybe if you can do it the whole time with your avatar dancing. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do that. I, I got up, I said goodbye to everybody and walked right through the potted plant. So I, I still don't quite have the body movement mastered yet. I, I don't think I would have done a very good job in there. That would have, yeah. Hats off to you for being able to make it through. <laughs> Second life interview. All right. That's great. Thank you very much once again, and good luck with the book. Fool Me Twice, everyone. This is Sean Lawrence Otto. And this is This Week in Science. We've come to the end of another hour of science discussion. There were a couple of Minion mailbags that I wanted to read through really quickly before we... Uh, wrap it up. Uh, this first one from Dave Darman. He said, first, I want to say how much I enjoy the twist episodes that you and Just Justin put together. I'm a graduate student at the University of Maryland College Park studying applied mathematics. I look forward to your show every week to keep me abreast of the latest happenings in the world of science. It can be easy to get stuck in my get my head stuck in my own research, and I appreciate the opportun opportunity you both afford to immerse myself in the rest of the world of science. When I heard you begin to describe the serial killer math story, I couldn't help but cringe. While the article sounds interesting, it's really a terrible conglomeration of bad statistics, crackpot neuroscience, and general silliness on the part of the authors. Dr. Cosma Shalizi, a statistics press professor at Carnegie Mellon University, has a very readable and scathing explanation of Simkin and Roy Chaduri's errors on his blog. The short version is that the data is much better fit by a log normal distribution than a power law distribution. And this is a common mate, mistake made by many researchers. Because their neuroscientific model depends on the number of days between murders being power law distributed, the model couldn't be correct since the data isn't power law distributed. So, Thankfully, this paper has not been published in any peer-reviewed journals yet. We can only hope that peer review will do its job and stop the article before it becomes a canon. Thanks, Dave, for, uh, for writing in and setting us straight on that study. Statistics and math are applied math even <laughs> better. Um, this next letter from Graham Dixon says uh, he enjoyed the episode of Twists, especially the interview with Eugenie Scott from NCSE. The conversation around global warming, especially comments about Justin's support for nuclear energy as a less damaging energy source, brought to mind a concern I have about the arguments in support of global warming and what we need to do about it. The argument for cause of global warming has become focused on the role of CO2 and other gases, leading to the conclusion that we must manage, read, reduce, the level of these gases in our environment. In my view, there is another important factor which impacts the danger of nuclear energy in that the total energy contained in our biosphere is increasing unnaturally when we extract energy from any external energy source. The use of fossil fuels obviously increases the amount of CO2 in our environment. It also increases the total energy in our environment, therefore thereby increasing the energy which must be radiated into space in order to maintain thermal equilibrium. The la this latter contributing effect is also present in the use of nuclear energy sources. In my opinion, we must reduce the use of all energy sources that are not already part of our atmospheric thermal equilibrium, including fossil, nuclear, and the harebrained idea of trapping energy in nearby space and transmitting it to Earth for our use. I've not heard this aspect of the problem being mentioned in any discussions in the media I wonder if it's been overlooked, overlooked or not mentioned in order to maintain simplicity in discussion. And he's interested in our thoughts. Well, um, I don't understand the science behind all of this uh, well enough to go into it in detail, but I I, I can a little bit. I can a little bit. A nuclear power plant is, is uh, something like several kilometers. If you created a solar panel that was just grabbing sunlight, it would, you know, that was covered several kilometers of of space on earth it would be a nuclear power plant so the the energy that we're 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 producing with this uh, the you know the idea that there's some more, more heat and energy being created by the work of that energy uh is nothing uh, compared to what the sun is delivering to us it, it wouldn't be significant 
And that's and that's why there isn't a real debate on the amount of energy we're producing that's being that has to escape somehow our atmosphere. It's 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 inconsequentially a small number compared to the amount of radiation we get from the sun. Uh, it's yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. The amount of energy that we get from the sun is is massive. Um, but we add enough by way of gases that we yeah. can amplify various effects of uh, of the energy that is of the trapping from the sun. Trapped. It's the sun's yeah. heat still. It's not, nothing that we're producing energy wise here is going to affect that system. That's too small. But yeah, we're creating differences in the way the atmosphere traps heat from the sun. And that's that's the problem. That is the big problem, the greenhouse effect, so to speak. Anyway, that does it for this week's show. Uh, it was a lot of fun talking to Sean Otto. And on next week's show, it's just going to be all science stories the whole mm -hmm. hour. That's right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is available as a podcast. Just search for This Week in Science in the iTunes directory. Or if you have an Android device, you can look for the Twist for Droid app in the Android Marketplace. Twist the number four Droid app in the Marketplace. And for more information on anything that you have heard here today, show notes are going to be available at our website, twist.org. We want to hear from you as well, so send us an email. I'm Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, or you can email Justin at thisweekinscience.com. Be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also contact us uh, on Twitter, at Dr. Kiki or at Jackson Fly, all one word there. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover, address suggestion for a story and an interview, let us know. Also, check us out on the Facebook. It's science with a twist, with a T at the end. Uh, that's a minion-created page of like-minded sciencey fans who share stories all week long, uh, many of which actually end up on the show. And we will be back here next week once again with more science news. We hope you'll join us. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. <laughs> this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way so everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi, aye, 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 aye. Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. science. Laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got But how can I ever 
never see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week. This week in science is coming your way. You better just listen to what we say. And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said, then please just remember it's all in your head. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science, this week in science, this week in science.